All right, hi guys. Uh, I'm Leonard Law. I'm one of the product managers at Google uh, that helps take care of our enterprise strategy. You know, the reason I love working with Google Cloud uh, is seeing companies that are driving innovation and, and business transformation in their firms. But I have to be honest, uh, when I think of agriculture and clouds, I usually think about rain, not technology. Uh, but that's why, you know, sometimes innovation comes from surprising places, and that's why it's my incredible pleasure today to introduce you to uh, Teddy Bacelli from Lana Lakes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for coming to the session. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, really excited to tell our story and the th some of the things we've done here. Uh, I lead IT for one of the divisions within Winfield, within uh, Lando Lakes. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and then Joey Jablonski from um, Cloud Technology Partners here to tell us about the the journey that helped us uh, th along the way. So with that. Um, what are we going to talk about today? And I'm actually going to read this because I don't want to screw it up. I tried to memorize it and I was kind of forgetting. So, by 2050, the world's exploding demand will require farms to feed upwards of 10 billion people. Global leader in precision agriculture, Lando Lakes, uses a novel, novel application of cloud scale compute analytics to revolutionize modern farming to produce more corn on fewer acres today compared to 50 years ago. What does that mean? That means is I get to do things like, when I was a kid, you know, what do you want to go do when you grow up? I want to solve world hunger. And, uh, and some of the things I'm able to do now is actually do that. And I get to do that using cloud, which is really, really exciting. So first of all, who here has heard of Lando Lakes? Awesome, most hands, if you haven't, see me later, I have packets of butter for you. We'll hand <laughs> those out, right? So I gave you one clue, uh, butter, what else do we make? Anybody have any ideas? What was that? Calf food. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a So Purina. So one of the names under Lando Lakes is a Purina. And so we made uh, animal feed. And actually, not quite calf food, because cat and dog is owned by Nestle, but every other animal. So think of farm animals, cattle, chickens, <laughs> horses, and all that. We have feed for that. And then the largest division within Lando Lakes that most people don't know about is actually our crop inputs business under the name Winfield. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about today is what Winfield does and who we are and then how we've kind of taken technology sort of uh, to the next level. And really what we do as a crop input distributor is we buy uh, seed, crop protection, plant nutrition products from big manufacturers and then sell them to our customers who are also our owners and those customers in turn sell them to growers. So we work closely on, on ag fields with a, lot of, uh, with a lot of agronomists and with a lot of farmers trying to help them solve different problems. Now, one of the big things for us is because of, you know, you kind of talk about, okay, so you have butter, you have uh, crop inputs, you have animal feed, how does that all, it's kind of a weird holding company. And actually it's not, it's actually carefully put together uh, because our owners are, our, uh, again, like dairy producers and ag providers. And really one of the things that gives us the ability is to look at the whole food chain. So, I'll give you an example. We sell seed or we also manufacture some seed. So you think about, we put that stuff in the ground, it grows, and let's say for example, that's corn silage or alfalfa, alpha, which are crops. Those are then fed to animals. Take example, cows. So we feed the cows, control the formulation, and then from those cows, milk is produced. We buy that milk back from the dairy producers. We make butter, cheese, milk, et cetera, and that gets up in the uh, grocery stores that you guys consume. So one of the things we get to see is the end to end, from the time something was first created all the way down to you guys consuming it in the stores. And that becomes a lot of fun because you get to see all the opportunities, risks, and challenges within that value chain. So what are some of those challenges, right? So one of the things we see clearly is that by 2050, the world population, which is at 7 billion now, is going to go to 9.2 billion. And actually, the latest numbers would say that you're going to go up to 10.4 billion. So that's interesting. So we got to feed more people. Um, now, the other thing is also, in a lot of the developing countries, the, uh, they're getting better and better, so the middle class is rising. And because the middle class is rising, their diets change, and so they want you know, more protein in their diet, et cetera. So that what really that leads to is that 70% you know, more food production than what we have today. Right? So, okay, you go, that's kind of interesting. Good, good statistic at a high level. But here's the, here's the other side, which is the challenge. Only 12% of the land between now and 2050 is arable. Actually, no, that's not correct. It's 5%. 12% is arable period, 5% because you, know, you have large investments, you have areas that don't have water, you'd have to put big irrigation systems in place, a lot of infrastructure investments that don't make sense yet. So you can only kind of farm where you can, um, and so that is only 5%. And by the way, agriculture is also one of the most water-intensive uh, industries out there, and we require more water, 
than anything else out there. It's one of the oldest industries, and, and that's in water is key to that. So we would, you know, we need 40% more water than we actually have today. So that becomes a challenge. So really, what, what do we get to at the end of the day? We need to produce more food, but we have less resources to do it. So now in IT, that's not, that's not an uncommon or unheard of challenge, do more with less. But in agriculture, where you get to plant a crop once, you wait a whole year and it grows again, the idea is, okay, what, what do you want me to do there? How does, that, how does that happen? How can we make that happen? Now the good news is this is where IT kicks in. This is where technology really makes a difference. So what you see on this chart is sort of the evolution of agriculture over time. So on the x-axis, you have the years you know, from the 1900s all the way till the 2050 or 2060 mark. And there's been some revolutions along the way. So the mechanicization was the first revolution. That's sort of the tractors. The tractors got smarter. right? They started to do more and more things. And actually today, some of these tractors and combines drive themselves. So the guy actually sitting in the cab is look, watching Netflix um, if he's you know, not on top of his game. If he's on top of his game, he's watching crop prices and making business decisions. But it's very much automated. Um, then you had the biotech revolution. That started about the 1950s, and so all of a sudden, the seeds you put in the ground, um, they, they started, you know, the technology went into it, and, a lot of, and you could produce more with what you had, and that's still what's fueling agriculture today. However, uh, this next revolution is really gonna come from technology. And what do I mean by that? So you take the largest crop in the United States today, which is corn, and, uh, and we produce about, on average, 170 bushels per acre. I know for, for those of you not in ag, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I was told not to go into agronomy too much, but I have to a little bit for you to get it. So 170 bushels an acre, just think of it as a number. If we were to increase production from 170 bushels an acre to 180 bushels an acre, that's a 10 bushel increase. That's the same as creating 5 million virtual acres. Right? So essentially, here's the idea that, hey, we can produce production just a little bit. You can actually produce more with what you already have. And by the way, if you control those inputs, you could actually keep the inputs the same and still produce more, right? Now, here's another interesting statistic for you guys. The highest recorded yield for corn in the United States was actually happened last year at 530 bushels an acre, right? So in a field, right, not in a greenhouse or lab controlled, actually that potential go up to 1,000, but in a given field, somebody's actually able to achieve 530 bushels an acre. So really, if you go from the average of 170 and the high end is 530, you're like, well, how does that happen, right? Well, if you can make Agriculture today is still intuition driven. I do it the way my dad did it. Maybe I disagreed with a few things, so I'm gonna make those changes, but essentially it's more of a feel. It's still an art. But you start bringing data driven uh, uh, facts to these farmers that say, hey, use this technology and use some crop modeling. Use some scouting. Uh, use some uh, drone imagery for, for that matter. You can, you can kind of see what's happening in your large field. So I'm not talking about a small field, but like a 100 acre field. And then because you can make better decisions, now you can achieve this, uh, uh, this, this high range you can get to. I'll give you just an example. This is one of the tools we use today. Um, and what you see here is, so what we do is we take satellite imagery. So we take an image, you know, and it's gotta be clear with no, with no clouds in the way. But if we're able to achieve that, then the reflection off the light off a plant, we can, it, it, it's different. For a healthy plant, it reflects differently than a, an unhealthy plant. What we do is we take a lot of that light reflection, we assign it a score, let's say a 10, like if it's good, and two if it's bad, and then you take a color like dark green for the good and red for the two, and essentially now you can create like a geospatial uh, algorithm with a file on top of it that shows you how that field is performing, and nobody's ever stepped field, uh, foot on that field. So what you can see here is in zone number one, that's a, that's a hard area, you can see there that we hardly have anything growing in that spot. Makes sense, right? That probably was a score of zero. And then in number four, or number two, which was the dark green, you can barely see that uh, wind field sign in there, which means that crop's doing really well. So now all of a sudden you sort of have this idea of like, okay, I can understand where the crop is struggling and maybe I need to do something there, or the crop is doing well. So that's one decision you can make off of this. Another decision could be, hey, next year when I plant, I know that area number two and number three really are high yielding. So what I want to do there is maybe I'll push the population, which means I'll put more seeds into the ground in those specific spots, and if I do that, I can yield more than I do if I put the same amount in zone number one. It's called a variable rate planting. So all of a sudden, with the same amount of inputs that you had before, you're actually able to produce more. All right, so this is the type of technology we're getting into today. A lot of fun, very, very exciting. But again, you're going from this intuition art down into a little bit of a science, which is, which is, uh, which is pretty exciting. And another thing here to, to note, for example, is you know, we talk a little bit about you know, agriculture using technology. And I was talking to one of our presidents in our division. I was trying to explain to him what IoT was, right? 
He's like, IoT, what is that? Internet of Things. He's like, he kind of just said the same thing again. I'm not really sure what that means. So I'm like, okay, so you have these sensors that you can put in devices or machines that really weren't doing anything before. They were dumb devices. Now you're putting something in there that starts talking, and all of a sudden this device has a voice. It started to tell you what it's doing. You collect this with a whole bunch of other devices. You run some analytics on top of that, and by the way, now you have some great insights. He's like, oh, wow. Like, we do that in agriculture with the new stuff we're doing, right? Each plant is a thing, like an Internet of Things. So if you think about it in agriculture, we didn't even think about it before, but we're actually doing these type of things where Internet of Thing is not necessarily a sensor in something. It could just be the thing itself is actually telling you, hey, I'm, I'm happy and healthy, or I'm sick and I'm not doing well. So kind of interesting stuff. So how does cloud fit into all this, right? Well, here's the, here's the decision. So all these great tools are coming to the market. We have one. Our competitors have some. A lot of uh, partners in the market are really helping us uh, put a lot of cool tools together. But what's happening? These tools don't talk to each other. Uh, a lot of these are geospatial files. They're very big. They're very complex. Um, you know, you have, you have prescriptions. You have tissue samples. You have scouting reports. And the idea is for one tool to be really effective, it needs information from another tool. And yes, we could create a, a connection between the two, but some of this information is actually common to many of these tools. And what we want to do is tell the farmer, here, go use these three things when, the, when your crop is growing, and you'll, be, you know, you'll get to from that 170 bushels to 200. But he's like, well, you know, using three is going to be really complicated. I have a barrier to use it to begin with. Then I have to re-enter stuff three times. That doesn't work. So that's where we came to the idea was we need some sort of centralized cloud solution. We need something that's going to collect information from different tools, right? So you see R7 tool up there on the, on the left. And we're going to put some boundaries and um, prescriptions from there into this centralized place. And from the centralized place, we're going to then give that information to another tool. So this was the concept that we came up with and said, this is a really neat idea. And by the way, it should live in the cloud. It makes sense because these files get humongous. And we have 300,000 farmers in the United States. So this is going to get bigger and bigger. And so that's the idea of like, maybe we need to look at this. And maybe we need to look at a cloud solution um, concept came into play. And so we reached out and we looked at you know, the various cloud solutions available out there. And you know, one of the things we found that GCP really offered was like really kind of fit our needs for the things we were looking for with the geospatial needs, with some of the newer technologies that we were uh, embarking on. This seemed to be a really good fit. And Google also turned us to one of their partners that could help us in the space. And this is where cloud technology partners came in. And they really helped us figure out how we would put this uh, how we put this infrastructure in place so that we could really enable our tools and enable the farmers to make a better decision. So I'll turn it over to Joey here, and uh, he'll tell you, kind of talk you through the, uh, they told us, you know, they told me to keep the agronomy to a minimum, so hopefully I did that. But he's going to go more into the technical infrastructure and how we built the solution. Great. Thanks, Teddy. <laughs> so as Teddy mentioned, I work for Cloud Technology Partners. Uh, we got the privilege of spending almost uh, an entire year working very closely with the team at Lando Lakes as part of the Winfield Group, building out Data Silo. When we first started with Data Silo, we had a million ideas. We sat down with the agronomists across Lando Lakes. We sat down with agronomists from their partner retailers. And what we knew was that we had a million features that we wanted to build. We knew that we had a problem we wanted to solve around integrating data from a variety of different sources. And we knew that we wanted to use the latest and greatest in modern technologies. So we started with an assessment of the cloud vendors that are out there. We settled on the Google platform as the capability that gave us the fastest time to market. So we're able to iterate very, very quickly in what we were developing. We were able to try new technologies without having to build servers, without having to put them in the data center. Because of Google's portfolio, we were able to try different things, BigQuery, Cloud SQL, Data Store, and use the technologies that made the best sense for us from a development perspective, from a feature perspective, and also from a geospatial perspective. Um, everything we did in Data Silo is spatial in nature, so being able to leverage Google Maps, being able to leverage some of the expertise that Google brought really gave us an advantage that allowed us to get this application developed and tested quickly. So what is Data Silo? At the end of the day, Data Silo is going to give us four sets of capabilities. The ability to store information from disparate sources, the ability to share that information, to be able to allow farmers to give access to their data to other people, to be able to search this information, be able to look at data by growing season, by location, by address, by spatial point, and most importantly, be able to control this data, being able to control who has access to it, what systems the data is fed to automatically. 
Um, when we first started Data Silo, our focal point was very much internal systems there at Lando Lakes and systems that the farmers leveraged. Tools like R7 for building crop prescriptions, essentially defining how many seeds I'm gonna plant per given acre. Tools like Scout Pro that give us the ability to scout a field and take images and samples. And then tools like Nutra Solutions that are laboratory management capabilities that show us test results and sample information. Data Silo was initially built to bring these together, but most importantly, to connect to the rest of the ecosystem that's being built within the uh, uh, agriculture space. Companies like Monsanto, companies like John Deere that are also putting data online. Prior to tools like Data Silo, prior to some of these integrations that we built, literally the method for moving data around in the agriculture space is USB drives. It was not uncommon for someone to download a file on their computer onto a USB drive, give it to a retailer who then plugs it into a monitor on their tractor to go use that data, and then do the reverse, download the as planted information from the monitor, put it back onto the USB drive, snail mail it back to somebody else. Data silo is meant to solve that problem, so we're not moving USB drives anymore. <clears throat> One of the key elements, though, with Data Silo that we wanted to focus on from early on is access to information and privacy. So there's certain information that farmers are extremely sensitive to keeping confidential and not sharing with a wider audience. Yield information is that. Growers don't want to share how successful their fields are. They have their own patterns and practices that they use to get that level of efficiency, they don't want to share that information very widely. There's also, in, like any industry, legal rules. Information about plots of land, GIS coordinates that make them up, are protected information that need to be defended properly. So when we built Data Silo, we built it from the ground up with an access control infrastructure that allows us to ensure that the owner of that data, the grower, the operator of that field, can control exactly who sees their data, when, they can audit that access, and most importantly, they can revoke that access and control it. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about the development timeline of Data Silo. We learned a lot as we went into this process. And we went into it with one key assumption, was that we don't know what we're doing here. This is the first of its kind application in the market, so let's not try to invent things that are too far along without getting market validation, without getting experts to, to validate what we're doing. So we started this project. Um, I actually remember the, uh, the kickoff for this project was on my birthday of last year, I, uh, so I, I will remember that day well. Um, got to spend it with, uh, with a new client. Um, so we started the project with a variety of discovery workshops. So we sat down with about 20 people from across Lando Lakes, from across partners and retailers of theirs, and we just did brainstorming sessions, writing out every possible idea about features, usability, drawing out potential UIs on the board. <clears throat> we then moved into designing our data model. So one of the challenges that we ran into early was that we're integrating data from a variety of different systems. Some of them are file-based, some of them are, are relational database-based. But most importantly, no single person had ever done design across all of them. So there was no clean mapping of data between those systems. So we started with building a data model that would allow us to ingest data from source systems and put it into a standard data model that would then allow us to evolve over time and build standardized APIs, standardized workflows. <clears throat> and then we built the data silo. Um, one, of our, one of our real powerful proof points on data silo was one of the key features that we wanted to demonstrate to the agronomist was visual display of field boundaries. So essentially lines that designate where a field is in a certain, a certain area. Um, from a development perspective, not an extremely complicated thing to do. There's, there's libraries out there that do it. Google Maps provide, provides functionality. But being able to do this with live data that came out of other Lando Lake systems was a very important step because of the file format challenges. Um, that first feature that we built, we were able to demonstrate at the end of the second week. So essentially our first sprint as part of the project. This really shows the power of being able to empower our developers. We weren't focused on deploying servers. We weren't focused on networking problems. We were focused on writing code, deploying it in App Engine, and then testing it. But most importantly, not testing it from a developer perspective only, but letting our agronomists, the end consumers of this application, test it as well. 
We did a security assessment early on in the project. We brought in the security team from Lando Lakes, we brought in an expert from my team to really make sure that the model that we built was defendable and that the data was gonna be protected in the way our, our growers would be comfortable with it. And then finally, showing these boundaries that I talked about. The key here is that we learned a very important lesson around April of this project and made a very fundamental shift. We started this project with a very file-based mindset. How can we share files? How can we control access to files? The reason we did that is because we were coming from the agronomist perspective. The way they interacted was they moved files around. They put them on a USB drive. They emailed them to people. From a development perspective, this became very difficult. When you get data in various file formats, the quality is poor, people muck with the extensions because of their uh, virus protection. Um, files are hard to parse, particularly when they're shape files because there are a variety of different standards in the industry that are used. So this file-centric approach caused us a lot of problems in the development cycle. Uh, we were running into data quality issues, running into performance problems. <clears throat> so we, we stepped back a little bit and said, okay, let's stop looking at it from a file perspective. Do growers really need files in what they do? And it occurred to us that they don't. At the end of the day, the growers need to control information about their fields. They need to control prescriptions as planted information, GIS information. So we threw out all of that file-based approach that we took with the application and really switched to a completely GIS or a spatial-based application. This was actually really good. This allowed us to simplify our data model. Literally about half of our tables and relationships in our data model completely went away as we went to the spatial approach because we no longer had to build relationships in the database, we were able to infer them spatially. <clears throat> Simplified our database. We did move database platforms as part of this change. We went to a database that supported a lot more GIS capability than the initial one we started with. <clears throat> and then uh, finally building a lot more UI capabilities. One of the other challenges we had learned as we started to do iterative demos after every sprint was that we were getting a lot of feedback, particularly from Teddy and some of his peers, that the rendering on the screen wasn't proper, that elements weren't showing up on the screen. And it finally occurred to us that we were doing all of our development on a desktop. We were assuming the retailers were gonna be using a desktop interface as well. And it turns out people like Teddy don't even own desktops. They do everything from their phone. So we made a very drastic change in the development cycle here and moved to a completely mobile-first development cycle with the desktop interfaces coming as a secondary testing and secondary development. This enrichment of the UI, a lot of the retailers gave us very positive feedback because anyone in the field is first gonna be on a tablet or a phone, and much later on they'll be on a, on a full desktop or a laptop. Um. This second phase of the project made April, we started building a lot of our APIs as well. So instead of moving files between systems, we got to a very programmatic approach. We were able to allow API connectivity into data silo. This became a very important focal point because suddenly systems like R7, Nutra Solutions could connect automatically, send a lot of data to data silo, and external systems could query that information and get it as well. We did another security assessment. We made a lot of fundamental changes to the architecture in the second phase, so we moved, uh, did a secondary security assessment. And ultimately what we ended up with was a very spatial application, that people could find locations on a map and find all the data associated with it. They could query by season, they could query by type of crop, and find information that way, rather than this file-based approach with naming conventions that become inconsistent. This got us a lot of very positive feedback, um, particularly from the retailers that we were demoing and using as our live audience. And we also replatformed the app. Um, we had actually started with Google Compute Engine um, when we first started building the app for speed. As we moved a lot more of these spatial capabilities, we actually made a choice to move to Google Compute as, um, instead of Com App Engine, mainly to give us a lot more GIS functionality, simplify things for the developers. <clears throat> So this file-centric to spatial-centric was really a, a, it was a big light bulb. I remember the day in the conference room with Ananth, one of the architects that works for Teddy, where we finally realized that this was the solution to all of our feedback we were getting about a poor UI experience, about poor performance, this file-based pr approach was the, the challenge. <clears throat> 
So let's talk a little bit about the functional architecture. So we built out Data Silo. We really built three functional areas that are unique in terms of what they provide. We built a presentation layer, and this presentation layer gives us things like search capabilities, the login, all of our landing pages, but also more advanced features like impersonation. Impersonation was critical from a support perspective. Imagine you're a, you're a farmer, you're working out in Indiana, and you've got a problem with data silo. It's not showing the data you expect. You call the Lando Lake support line, that individual should be able to impersonate that grower and identify exactly what they're seeing. So we built those sorts of capabilities that came from feedback from the retailer community. We also built our access layer. So the APIs that we built, built our uh, data transformations. But most importantly, we focused on compliance with industry standards. So OATA is an agriculture uh, standards body that's focusing on data exchange, trying to drive some standards for how these organizations work together. And then finally, we built our data layer. So our database plus our, our associated functionality around how we store things like tissue samples, like prescriptions. <clears throat> so from a, from a logical architecture, um, the application was built to be highly scalable, but within reason. So Teddy mentioned earlier that there's about 300,000 farmers here in the United States. That's good, actually. So we never had to build an application for a million users. We're never going to have a million simultaneous users on Data Silo. So we built things with technologies that were proven around that idea. So some of the technologies that we built Data Silo, people will look at and say, well, those are, you know, we were using those five years ago. And it's true, we were, and they work. So we didn't want to overcomplicate the issue for a couple of reasons. One, finding software engineers for extremely modern languages is much more difficult than for proven languages like PHP, like Java. So we went with technologies that were proven. We also went with a database model that provide us highly scalability, because the reality is it's a very read-intensive environment. We're really not writing that much data in the grand scheme of things. So we used a, a more traditional database model with read-only slaves to give us scalability. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier about our, our data model. And one of the areas we were able to hugely simplify data silos is when we moved to a geospatial approach rather than a file approach. <clears throat> what this allowed us to do was instead of building relationships in a database between things like fertilizer prescriptions and a field, a field and a farm, a farm and a grower, we're able to infer that information because a seed prescription or a fertilizer prescription have a spatial location. Our field has a boundary, so identifying whether that point fits in the boundary becomes a mathematical calculation rather than hard relationships in the database. This also became important. Some of the early feedback we got from retailers was, well, I want to upload a, field, a crop prescription, but I haven't defined my field yet. I haven't built in the data silo. So by this spatial nature, we're essentially able to go take all of our data, throw it into data silo, and then identify how it's related to one another. And then as time goes on, you can add additional fields. You can add additional views on it. One of the key things to keep in mind in the agriculture space is that a field is not a lifelong concept. A field tends to be something that's memorable to the grower. You know, Joe's field, Bob's farm. Sometimes there's an address associated with maybe what road it's on, the corner, the intersection of what highways. But most importantly, that field, the polygon, the, the spatial information for it changes every single growing season because you may have taken out a tree that was in the corner of the field. The stream may be running a little bit higher flow this year than it was last year. So that information is constantly changing year after year. So as we built our data model, we tried to stay away from any assumptions about relationships for fields, for the data associated with it, and let the grower choose those. Let them decide how the data is related to one another. <clears throat> So this is a, another representation of the data model. So at the center, what you'll see is that we define resources. And in data silo, what we defined was essentially anything as a resource, a prescription, a field, a boundary, um, tissue samples, and soil samples. Those resources then have access controls that associate with them. So we have tables that define who can access the data, what they can do with it. Most importantly, we have an audit table, so we can identify who changed data when, who uploaded data when, where it came from. 
And then, of course, all of our user information. The user information is where we store things like defaults when user logged in. We actually had a concept in the application called widgets, that when you log into the application, there's a widget that tells you how many acres you have mapped in the system, how many crop prescriptions you have, um, harvest information. So those sorts of defaults as to what experience the user wants when they log in. <clears throat> Um, from a functional perspective, we had a variety of technologies that we used. Um, at the top tier, so essentially presentation, we used Bootstrap as our uh, mobile and our responsive framework, supported by HTML and a little bit of PHP. All of our APIs were essentially endpoints that we exposed and wrote in, in PHP. At the application level, we really built two functional areas. We built all of our business logic in PHP. It's easy to mock up, it's fast to develop, Easy to, easy to redo if we have to throw out se sections of the code. Um, but most importantly, we built our file processing. So one item I'm, I've mentioned a lot is uh, shape files. Essentially, a shape file is a GIS standard for how you exchange information about a field or a bunch of points. Well, there's a certain type of shape file you get in agriculture called an as-planted. An as-planted essentially defines how many seeds were planted at what GIS locations in a field. Well, you imagine a field that's you know, even a few acres, these files tend to have millions and millions of points. So we wanted a very highly scalable processing engine to bring in these shape files, to decompose them into something that we can store in the database in a meaningful way. So we built this Python file processor that can bring all this data in and process it. And ultimately, we used uh, the Zend framework as our, our PHP framework to get us going quickly, build technology quickly. <clears throat> So the other piece that we talked about quite a bit was API. Um, I think you know over the course of the, the nine months to, to build Data Silo, we probably had about 150 hours of meetings on API design. And the struggle we had for API design was that there's, first off, no industry standards. So there really wasn't anything we could, we could key off of. There are several industry bodies that are there, things like ADAPT, organizations like OATA, but they're not ratified yet. So there are standards that we could try to leverage to the best of our ability, but they're really not finalized yet. Um, the other element is that the API structure gets very complicated as you start to look at all the potential options. So one of the things that we did early on in Data Silo is we really kept a small focus. We started with connectivity to R7. So that meant all we had to deal with was prescriptions, and then we started talking to Nutra solutions. So then we could bring in tissue and soil samples. We took this same approach with the APIs. So we built APIs to start with a small subset of our data types and then increasing from there. <clears throat> so from a, a platform perspective, um, we've used a variety of technologies. As I mentioned, we did start with App Engine, um, really, really you know, get going quickly, build technology. Ultimately, we moved to Compute Engine just because there were some GIS capabilities that we needed that we needed to install locally in a, in a full operating system. And then we leveraged uh, Google's cloud storage quite a bit. The idea behind cloud storage was that all of these files that were coming inbound, these shape files, these other exchange formats like CSVs, we needed a place to store them in their raw format. We weren't actually decomposing all the files in their entirety in Data Silo. We only extracted the information we needed to provide the user with the experience that we were, we were targeting for Data Silo. So we stored all of our raw data. Any JSON objects that came in as part of API connectivity, we stored in, in cloud storage as well. So that if we ever needed to go back and recreate data, restructure the database, we had the raw information to go do that as we needed. The other power of the, the platform that we see longer term is as we add additional data types, one of the visions for data silo long term is to start bringing in uh, satellite imagery so that people can enhance that with the information stored in data silo. So tools like cloud storage will become very valuable. As we start to bring in more and more tissue samples, soil sample, as more sensors get used, tools like BigQuery will become very powerful to be able to connect to very quickly and query large amounts of information that is, that is heavily read only. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about our, uh, our lessons learned. Um, the cloud, the cloud was good, and there, there were parts of it that were bad as well. So it was good from a flexibility perspective. We were able to build apps very, very quickly. 
The struggle was there is a learning curve for it. You need to be cognizant up front that the way you do operations, the way you build your environment, the way you monitor it is different. So as part of the project, what we did is we sat down with some of Teddy's peers that run the IT operations side and spent time talking with them about how they would operate a system like this. We didn't go into it blind saying, we build the application and then it's perfect. We realized that we build it, then we hand it off to an operations team, and then they have to run with it for the foreseeable future. So we sat down with those operations teams early and made sure they had the instrumentation they needed. One of the pieces that their operations team was very sensitive to was availability of the application. So we actually instrumented the application for a lot of monitoring capabilities. So their monitoring systems could connect to the application in different ways and verify that the file processor was working independently from the UI, which was working independently from the business logic on the back end. So we instrumented it for those operations folks. The other piece is understanding your user base. There's really two factors here. First is the scale comment that I made earlier. If you're not ever going to have a million users, don't design for a million users. You're just adding unnecessary complexity. We were lucky in that we had a population of users that we knew and we understood very well. They're also a group that we can plan very well. The thing about a growing season is we can plan for it every single year. We know when the growing season is going to start. We know when people are going to harvest. So we can plan our computing power, what we need, how many users are going to come into these systems based on that, that one year cycle. And then use technologies that your team is comfortable with. Um, one of the biggest struggles I see in organizations is shoehorning in technologies that the development teams, the operations teams aren't comfortable with. You're asking for an organization that's first going to push back, but secondarily not going to be as effective because they don't have the technology depth. One of the reasons we chose the technologies we did is because there are people at the Lando Lakes organization within their development team that understand them and can take that long-term cycle of adding additional features, debugging problems. So pick technologies that your company, your organization is comfortable with. It lowers that barrier to entry, makes people more comfortable with cloud as a platform because they're not having to learn as many new things at the same time. But once you're on the cloud, then it gives you a lot more technology that you can take advantage of once you're comfortable. Teddy, pass it back to you for the, uh, the last slide. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you kind of walked through a little bit of um, how we solved this problem, right? And one of the things, as, as Joey was talking, what's interesting is the name data silo, right? So if you, you know, kind of listen to what he said, it was anything but a silo, right? The idea is to make it more of a hub to, to uh, move information around. But the, one of the things about adapting to your customers, silo makes a lot of sense in a, in a farmer's world because your most important, oh, your prized possession is your grain that comes off your fields and that grain stored in a silo. So for them, that was the idea that you put it in a silo and then that's where the information's gonna be. Now what you see here on the chart is really, you know, this is a little bit of Land Lakes' story, a little bit of stories, you know, kind of an ag as, as a whole. And what you see is, you know, you have this chart and um, the uh, red line really represents the planted acres. And so over the years, it's kind of gone down a little bit depending on the years in which farmers didn't make money so they planted less, uh, to years where they made money so it went up a little bit. But the idea is it hasn't changed over the years. However, the crop production has gone up. Right? And so that's with the, uh, the uh, revolution on the, on, the, on the equipment, revolution on the biotech. And really what we're hoping for is now is that the technology is going to be the next frontier, uh, really the software development, cloud, IoT, all the things we talk about at this conference, really what's going to take us to the next level of producing more with less. And so that story we have and we want to continue it. Um, you know, really happy with you know, kind of the, the, the place where we are today. And I engage all of you to get um, familiar with agriculture and some of the things we're doing in technology there. Like I said, the opportunity is great, right? Like we talk about that 170 bushel an acre average all the way up, there's a the potential to get to 550. Really what's gonna get us there is, is, the, is the adoption of new technologies of kind of changing farming from intuition to a data-driven um, um, uh, industry. So with that, I thank you for your participation and, uh, and we'll take any questions at this point. Nope, yep. no question there. Oh, so the question was, um, were there cloud providers that we looked at as part of this process? Yeah, so we, we did look across the industry when we first kicked off this project. Um, we 
we had a we had a small set of requirements that we used for that that vendor assessment. First and foremost was speed. We wanted our development team to focus on building an application that we could demo. Um, we wanted a provider that was scalable. We wanted one that we knew was going to be there for the long run. We also wanted a provider that was flexible, that had a diverse enough portfolio of technologies that if we made the wrong technology decision early, we could pivot very quickly without having to change providers. So we did look across the board of the other public cloud providers, did a, a pretty detailed assessment, and ultimately settled on, on Google as the path forward. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. One thing I'll add is when we were doing that assessment and we had you know, CTP in with us, uh, the questions were, okay, so we kind of get at a high level, you want to build something where you store some files, maybe data, not really sure. And then I was like, yep, that's what we want to do. Can you tell us more about it? No, that's about what we want to do. <laughs> right? So the idea was, you know, we had to go through, and the idea was, okay, let's, let's start building something uh, that can get us, within six weeks, we can have a proof of concept for you. We work together on that. We learn and then we iterate from there. And that's really what, what helped us. And I would say we went through four or five iterations before we got to the point where we said, yeah, I think we, we, think we got what we need. Yep. And it was an interesting cycle. We, we did a traditional agile development cycle. We managed a backlog. We groomed it every couple of weeks. We did a sprint demo at the end of every, every two weeks. And the folks in that demo came from the agronomists at, at Lando Lakes, individuals from the retailers. And Ultimately what happened is there were some features that came out of those demos that the retailers and the agronomists like, thumbs up, those are great, let's keep iterating on those and make those features better. There were other features where the agronomist took one look at it and said, yeah, I know I asked for it, but I really don't need that. That feedback was invaluable. We were able to manage our time very effectively. We were able to focus in on features that provided real value. Uh, for the geographical information systems, uh, did you all use uh, completely uh, Google solutions or something like ESRI or any other uh, <clears throat> solutions outside the Google? Yeah. Right? So for our, the, the GIS components, we actually use Post uh, GIS, which is an open source set of libraries that run on top of Postgres. So that was our GIS infrastructure as part of Data Silo. Within Lando Lakes, there are other systems that are running the Esri toolkit, a lot of the desktop folks. So a lot of the files that we were receiving and the files that we were producing to send data out needed to be compliant with some of the Esri standards for um, you know, view, perspective, those types of things. In your workout. <laughs> So you talked a little bit about how you built the cloud, uh, the security solution mm -hmm. and some of the constraints, but I'm wondering, Teddy, in terms of just like adoption and earning the trust of farmers putting what I imagine is really, really precious data to them and you know other parts of your company, I'm kind of curious, like, how did that work and maybe even for the application overall? Yeah, good, good question. And, and, and data privacy and the whole trust thing is interesting. So farmers, if you want to find a conspiracy theorist, go to any farm. And, uh, <laughs> those, are, those are the guys out there. Everything is coming, the government out to get them, all that good stuff, right? Now, the one thing is I will say is um, our, our system, our company, the way it's built is a co-op. So actually the growers, the farmers own the retail locations and the retail location own us. So that kind of element of trust is already there. Um, and so what's interesting is, you know, we would go and you know, we as Winfield Land Lakes would try to pitch this information to a set of growers to kind of see what they felt like. And they're like, eh, I don't know about putting my stuff in something like that, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, but usually when we went there, we would go with the retail, the guy who's our customer in there. And he's like, oh, no, you don't have to worry about that. That's the type of stuff I would do for you, right? You already gave me your USB drives, a whole bunch of them in the office in my desk drawer. So it's a better way for me to manage this so then you and I can have a conversation about what we plan next year. Oh, that's fine. I mean, that's how that conversation would go. So, so these retail agronomists that are kind of local, I mean, some of them, you know, they, they go to each other's weddings, their kids play together, et cetera. So they have that level of trust. So it was very important for us to get those guys on board, which is why when we were doing a lot of the sprint demos, et cetera, we had those guys kind of give us feedback right away to make sure that that adoption was there. And actually, it turns out this was actually a need in the industry. A lot of people, you know, originally my, my kind of intent was, you know, we want to move files around so we could use these tools, and that's really the ultimate goal. But people even just felt better that like if I have a place where I can put my data and it's secure and it's you know it's not like in a USB drive or my computer that you know doesn't turn on anymore because it has a virus, uh, this was a, a lot better solution and so that was kind of a byproduct of it as well. 
Hi, I understand the impact that this kind of uh, data silo could have with the upstream supply chain and the farmers, but can you talk a little bit more about what you saw as the business impact with retailers? Yeah, so for retailers, the big deal was, um, so, so, you know, I'd say is our first, our challenge actually in adoption was with the, with the retail community at first, right? Because it was like, well, should I go with you guys or not? So we had a natural hedge there a little bit because it's cooperative structure. Right, so they, they, you know, they're willing to kind of work with us and they're already part of owning Land O'Lake, so if their general manager voted against it, it would still be something we wouldn't do. But as far as what helped them uh, at the end of the day is these guys talk to the farmers throughout the year. So they start out with in the spring or let's say in the fall, they talk about what are we going to do next year, right? What are we going to plant? Which seed do you want me to order? What kind of, uh, how are we going to protect the field going forward? Because next year it looks like it's going to be a wet year, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then, then the conversation moves into the spring where you actually plant the stuff into the field because the seed arrived. And then we get into the crop starts growing. What kind of decisions do we make now? Do we apply more nitrogen or not? You know, how do we, in which areas and all that kind of stuff. So. They, they, it's it's a kind of a mess today, a little bit, right? So it's it's almost like you're, you're running by with the seed, you know, like with the everything on fire, right? Like it's it's like one thing and then the other. So with these tools, they're able to better manage that relationship with the grower, right? So it was the idea was okay. So this tool is going to help you at this time of the year, and we're going to tell you how that works. This next time, this is how you're going to have the conversation. Then you look at like satellite imagery, and that's how you can have a conversation about which area is struggling. So with the fact that we said you could use these four or five tools now to help that grower have a discussion, it's gonna enable your business even further because once they have a better idea of how to make these decisions, then, then and, and, the, and the tools are connected to each other, you have a better, you know, sort of, they, there's no reason that grower is gonna go somewhere else, right? So they stick with you and that, that resonated a lot with them because even if they were friends, at the end of the day, if I got something else or a better story from another guy, I can go over there. So it, it showed them a way to say, this is how you keep your, your strong relationship even stronger than it is today. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. All right, with that, uh, I'd like to just wrap up the session. Thank you very much, Teddy, Joey, for your talk, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.